Hey everyone, Japanese import here. I think it's quite fair to say that most people probably don't know what exactly separates them from challenger players. In a game like League, it's possible to get challenger with very average mechanics and mostly just through decision making, especially on a role like jungle or support. And before anyone roasts me, those are the two roles that I play the most. I quite literally have arthritis in both hands from playing games way too much and from my Asian dad forcing me to practice piano. Safe to say, my mechanics aren't exactly measuring up to the greats anytime, well, ever. But we make do with what we have and play to our strengths. So today, I'm going to be walking you through why low elo looks so different from challenger and what exactly you can do differently as a support in order to level up your gameplay. Let's jump right into it. Starting off, we're taking a look at a bot lane matchup in platinum elo. Let's follow along with Bran as he gets into lane. The first thing you should notice is that the enemy laners aren't here yet. Some basic questions you should always be asking yourself throughout the entire game are what are my advantages and how do I punish the enemy with them? If we can ask the first question now, the thing we can confidently say is that we have a time advantage, and the second question can be answered with a few different things. One, we can push minions while the enemy can't, and two, we can take control of any space. However, we can notice that Bran doesn't do either of these things. He stands behind his minions, and that's it. I want to take note of one more thing before we jump into the challenger gameplay, which is where everyone is standing. Not only is Bran not threatening anything, it's not like anyone else in this lane is either. Three minions are dead, and no one's even touched each other, or really touched the wave. In just the time it takes for three minions to die, let me show you how I can tell when a game is high elo or not. Let's follow along with Thresh as he gets into lane. Immediately we should notice a very similar thematic. Thresh is in lane while his opponents are nowhere to be found. Let's just remind everyone that this means that we now have time to do something that will make our opponents lives difficult. Watch as Thresh moves forward getting as much control of space as he possibly can. Bush control is so important because it's a one way street in terms of applying pressure. Just existing in a bush demands a response. The important thing is that your opponents have to do something about it, and that's what's annoying. They either need to use a ward, which means it's not being used somewhere else, like watching for jungle ganks, or they have to force you out of it by using their cooldowns, face checking, or something else. It's just annoying. He obviously can't fight Aphelios and Bard in a 1v2 in their wave, so he is forced to back up. But watch as he does very slight turns and aims to hit Aphelios. Just threatening this auto in the first place means that Aphelios is forced to make a decision. Hit Thresh, or hit the wave. He cannot do both. This alone is a quiz for him. First it asks if Aphelios knows the correct answer to do here, and then he also has to make the correct follow up in regards to the wave. It's the same timer as in the previous game, but lots of things are different. There's a clear wave advantage for one side, and health has been traded. Challenger players do things that demand a response from the enemy. It's not enough to just sit back and wait for the opponents to mess up. You have to constantly quiz your adversaries on what they know, and that takes the form of making plays that will just add pressure and threaten things. I mean, let's just watch back and compare the first bit of the lane for each of these supports. If you look at it side by side, it becomes very obvious how one player is making his opponent play his game and the other is just existing. Let's focus on Thresh again. Now he's going to move up and try to take control of as much space as possible to try and win the war over the wave. He baits out Bard's Q with good spacing, and even though initially they had a minion advantage, it's now gone because Bard and Aphelios knew what to do here. However, we have to remember that these opponents are also challenger players. It's just like how in chess, two grandmasters are going to be basically making good moves for the vast majority of the game. Well, if a Grandmaster plays against someone at 1000 elo, they're going to win not because the Grandmaster will play different, better moves, but because the 1000 elo player will not know how to respond to them in the same way that the Grandmaster did. Again, it's a test. Now I want to highlight that Thresh is also asking the question of what is my advantage right now, and to be honest, it might not be clear. But as he hits the wave, it should become obvious that his relic stacks that he saved all this time were exactly what he was playing around. Now he's got a significant push advantage and immediately can look to move up to take advantage of the incoming level 2. He zones Aphelius and Bard completely off of the wave, and this is just beautifully played from both sides. 
Notice that not only was Thresh super good at realizing what his advantage actually was, the opponents were very good at realizing their state of disadvantage and backing off before any serious punish could happen to them. This recognition of advantage and disadvantage is the hallmark of high elo, and it's why there are so fewer kills as you climb. But the kills that do happen matter way more. Not only are players better at avoiding mistakes, they're better at punishing their leads as well. Let's just jump back into the low elo replay to see the difference. While Thresh and Bard were both very skilled at recognizing their states of advantage and disadvantage, the same can't be said here. Brand really doesn't seem to move at all in accordance to the game state. At this point, the enemies have a huge wave advantage and he's still up on the wave, not even exactly contesting it, but just standing there. Brand shouldn't even be here in the first place, because Caitlyn and Morgana should recognize it and fight immediately, which they fortunately do after a bit. Even after the fight, you'll notice how he continues to walk up to try and threaten, completely oblivious to the fact that a level 2 is incoming and he's in range for a Morgana binding, which happens to go on to his ADC instead. Caitlyn and Morgana were very slow to recognize the lead that they had, only walking up to zone when Morgana landed a straight binding, when they should have been far up to begin with. In addition to this, Bran and Jin didn't recognize the state of disadvantage they were in and walked right into a terrible situation. These two examples should highlight just how in not even a minute of laning, you can really see the difference in the quality of gameplay. Not only in the questions that the players are asking each other, but in the answers that they give. Let's take a look at a different challenger game, where both sides get to lane around the same time. Nami walks into lane and immediately begins to sweep the middle lane brush. However, Lulu is right there and immediately a fight breaks out. If we pause right before the wave even meets, we can just see how much these two laners really wanted this space. Lulu and Nami are both missing a significant portion of their health. Clearly, they were willing to fight and weren't scared to use their resources. If we look back on the health of the supports in the low elo example, even after the first three minions were dead, we can definitely notice the contrast. High elo players in general are more willing to trade health away, but why? The main reason is they want to use every resource available to them in order to gain leverage. Health, mana, time, space, all of these things are viewed as resources, and Nami here is probably thinking that she drastically beats Lulu in overall amounts of these given that she can convert mana to health. This all goes back to being able to recognize exactly how you can get an advantage and then using it to actually snowball. Over time, these trades add up, and while Nami and Lucian eventually gain control of the wave, once again the opponents are able to recognize it correctly and back off in time. If we fast forward about a minute, Lulu happens to get caught with a bubble while trying to save her ADC and dies for it. Aphelios ends up having to blow summoners and has to be in lane with really low health. Now, Nami knows that Lulu is going to have to help Aphelios try and crash this and the next wave in so that he can get a recall timing. So we once again need to ask, what is our advantage? Nami can predict where Lulu is going to be, and now based off of that, she's going to run all the way across the map to create a numbers advantage somewhere else. Notice that she does have a huge wave coming into bot lane at this point, but the potential gain of snowballing other lanes is just too big to pass up. She gets to top crab and assists in killing the enemy jungler before it's even possible for Lulu to be there. She knew she would have a tempo advantage to this play, and abused it. Now if we look at another platinum game, you'll see the contrast again. Leona and Akshan win their 2v2 fight in bottom, and then they work on pushing in the wave to secure a recall timing. Unfortunately, they're pushed off by the enemy jungler. However, Leona now bases and buys Moby Boots right away, and now knows exactly where Blitzcrank is. I think it's safe to say that any challenger support in this situation is running towards their raptor camp to try and potentially gain control of bot side vision, or even look for a gank on mid. In the worst case, you can just go back towards bottom. But all Leona does is walk bottom, and then doesn't do anything. It'd be one thing if she was trying to forcefully break the freeze, but she didn't try, and the opponent broke it for them anyways. Instead, now she wasted a minute or so of potential time where she should be influencing other lanes and making the enemy team play around her, but even with Moby Boots, she just doesn't recognize the advantage that she has. 
So you might be asking yourself why go to skillcap.com to improve when I could just watch YouTube guides or play the game. Well, let me show you. Let's say you're a support who's struggling to climb the ladder. Not only would you get over 40 site exclusive courses for support, but maybe really what you've been struggling with is trading as support. Well, we got you covered with six different courses breaking down how to trade as a support player. Not only do we have the largest catalog of guides for League of Legends in the entire world with over 1500 videos to watch, but these are then curated by the top coaches and players into courses on every skill and topic you need to master in order to truly improve and climb the ladder. If all of this wasn't enough, we haven't even touched on our catalog of over 700 smurf commentaries, where a challenger expert shows you how to climb out of your rank and you're guaranteed to get any questions answered by them directly. Not to mention, we're the only service to offer a rank improvement guarantee. If you don't climb at least 5 divisions while actively using Skillcapped, you can claim a refund, no questions asked. So what are you waiting for? Head to Skillcapped.com and get the rank you've always wanted. Link in the description below. Alright, so obviously this guide contained just a few examples of things that separates challenger players from the rest. We definitely didn't cover everything, but these are some of the most common that people are guilty of. Climbing in this game is just as much about knowledge and mindset as it is having skills needed to push buttons in certain ways. Just knowing what to do and when can really carry you all the way up the ladder. It's why a lot of players can watch challenger or pro games and feel like they can critique the players, but there's often just so much more going on than meets the eye, that you really don't have any idea until someone points it out. It's just that mechanically the game doesn't seem that different. But the small decisions and reasoning behind actions is what really gives it away to a more trained eye. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.